Hey, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Peace and power be to y'all, man, on this Thanksgiving Eve, okay? And today is November the 23rd of 2022. So I know y'all getting ready to get your little celebration on for tomorrow and all uh, for Thursday. I understand y'all was cooking or whatnot. I did my cooking earlier, so you know, I ain't made no turkey and everything. You know, I had my little, I, look, I prepped me a little something, something. Okay. So for me, I don't call it Thanksgiving. I like to call it the commemoration. I, I like to, I, I, I call it Commemoration Day. The reason why I call it Commemoration Day because it's the way to commemorate those who have lost their lives versus saying Happy Thanksgiving. So, you know, you, you got to commemorate people and commemorate things and, you know, commem commemorate uh, those uh, Native American who had lost their lives during that time period. So, yeah. So that's why I like to call it Commemoration Day. But but yeah, I ain't made no uh, turkey. <laughs> One no time, I had some rotisserie chicken that looked like turkey. I mean, you know how the rotisserie rotisserie chicken looks like turkey, right? You you blend it in together, you know, tie that thing together. You know, what I'm saying it looks like it looks like actual turkey, but it's not. It's rotisserie. You can pull that off, but however, I went to the grocery store and got that, and it was already cooked. You know, they already have it like in the bag, cooked and everything. On that I made with some greens, some yams, some cornbread, and uh, I boiled me some northern beans with that. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I got the roasted chicken from the grocery store. It was already roasted. It was already good. It's good. I love rotisserie chicken. It's already good. So, I was surprised it was good when you put that hot sauce on there. But anyways, enough of that. Let me go ahead and get started. <laughs> Let me see. He said, I'm glad you went live, those motherfuckers. Oh, you know what? Excuse me for the moment of silence. You know, Sinegro Sa is overrated. I, uh, you know, don't folks over there, they, I stay away from over there, okay? I stay away from over there. I do my thing over here, okay? I stay away. It's best. It's, you know what? It's a good thing. Let me tell you why I say it's a good thing for you, because it's, it, that goes to show you the mindset that these individuals have. So it's best for you not to go over there and not deal with that, bullsh that bullshit. It's best for you just stay over here. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Or stay in your lane. Because a lot of time you're gonna be dealing with a bunch of bullshit. Oh no, you good, you good though. No, you good. Hey Norman, how you doing? Yeah, they are pretty narcissistic. I mean, I don't go over there. Mm -mm. I don't. It, it's overrated. I mean, hey, you got to. That's and that's the thing. You gotta speak your mind. See, they don't like when you speak your mind, and then when you speak in facts, especially they don't like that. They don't like that foolishness. They, they, I mean, they don't like none of that at all. They want the foolishness. They want the BS. They don't like when somebody speak their mind. Okay? They really don't. But anyways, enough about them folks over there. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as you can see, the title of the video is about William Leo Hansberry. So I heard of the name before, but I don't remember where I heard the name from. I remember when I had a conversation and the brother brought the name. I'm like, that name sounds familiar, but I don't know where I heard that name from. So I had to look his name up. You know, we always often hear about Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, who I love. I admire Dr. Ben. I admire him. 
uh Ivan Ivan Van Sertima. Um what's the other one? Asia Hillard. Right? We heard so many names of those individuals, but we do not give enough credit to somebody like William Leo Hansberry. And so what I'm going to do is make sure that I can get a list of all the African-American scholars and historians and do a video on them as much as possible. OK, so. Uh, just last week, I did one about Charles L. Blossom this past week. I did one about Charles L. Blossom, who uh, was who is a historian and his information was based on African and African-Americans um in pennsylvania for the most part so i did that so i want to put my focus on william leo hansberry now i found as much information i possibly could on william leo hansberry um i was able to come across some books some articles and a website okay so let me go ahead and get started all right so uh so what I want to do is I want to go on to the bio right here, right? Which is walk out through this. If I had some money, if I had some money, boy, I wish I can get everybody a DNA test. I wish I can get everybody a DNA test for Christmas. If I had some money, I wish I can buy everybody that I have came across that denied this African heritage of theirs they deny that slavery did not exist or whatever i wish i can get them a dna test so they can take it and see what the results are that will be my gift to everyone that i've come across with the pseudo ideology i wish i can do that but i don't have the finances or the fortitude to do so but i will encourage each and every last individual out there to go get a DNA test for Christmas. <laughs> go get your DNA test. Go take an ancestry test. And you'll be surprised. And you'll be eager to learn. That's the only thing I can say. But I wish I had the finances to purchase all of that for everybody. <laughs> but anyways, let me go ahead and get started. So, William Leo Hansberry. Right? He was an American scholar. A lecturer. A pioneering afro centuries. He was the older brother of real estate broker Carl Augustus Hansberry, uncle of award-winning playwright Lorraine Hansberry. And for those who don't know who Lorraine Hansberry was, she was the one that written the play called Raising in the Sun. As a matter of fact, she played in the play. Um, Because I remember I seen the play in high school. It was with Cindy Portier. And I forgot the lady's name. But I know Lorraine Hansberry played as the sister in the movie. She played as a sister. Yeah, she did. So, yeah, she was the one that written the play called Raising in the Sun. It's a good play. Very good play. Um, it's kind of it's basically about a story about a man whose family, his mom and his wife and his kids and his sister all live in a one bedroom apartment and he trying to get up out their apartment so he can get them a house. Okay. So he's a, um, he was a taxi driver. I think he was a taxi driver or he was a valet, one of them. And he was just trying to get his family out the hood. So basically they was living in the hood. Well, at that time they called it the ghetto, but in our age, we call it the hood. So, yeah. So that's basically what the story is about. Um, it's a good, it's a good play, wonderful play, and I encourage people to watch it if they get a chance to. All right, but oh, but anyways, let's go ahead and get started. And he's the great grand uncle of actress Tay Hansberry, right? So he was born on February twenty fifth, eighteen ninety four, in Gloucester. Met County, Mississippi. He was the son of Eldon Hayes and Pauline Hansberry. His father taught history at Alcorn AM in Loma, Mississippi, but died when 
the younger Hans Bear was only three years old. He and his younger brother, Carl Augustus Hans Bear, were raised by his stepfather, Elijah Washington. All right, so it goes on to say that in 1915, he attended Atlanta University where he was exposed to a new volume of essays on race, all right, which was published by the university sociology department, which served as a major influence on him. Another big influence was the book, The Negro by W.E.B. Du Bois. After he purchased a copy of the book, he rushed to the school's library to refer to the references cited in the volume. To his dismay, Hansberry discovered Atlanta University reference library to be sorely lacking. As a result, he left Atlanta University two weeks into his sophomore year to transfer to the best equipped university he could find that would admit blacks. As a result, he began studies at Harvard University in February of 1917. He completed his undergraduate studies there in 1921. So it goes down to talk about upon his graduation from Harvard, Hansberry taught for a year at Strait College, which is now Diller University in New Orleans. So in September 1922, Hansberry joined the faculty of Howard University, where he started the African Civilization section of the History Department. So this is why he's so important, because he was the one that started the African studies in the uh, curriculum, you know, African study curriculum. And so he was given a title as the father of African studies. Okay. But there were so many people that came before him. You had Carter G. Woodson, right? Ontario Schromberg, um, just to name those two. And of course, you had um, Edward Blyden Wilmont. And not only Edward Blyden Wilmont, but uh, yeah, Martin Delaney. So just to name a few, just to name those few um, that that came before him, okay, or around the same time as him, basically. So as I mentioned, I'm going to make sure that I do a lot more videos on African American historians uh, and scholars that have not gained exposures and recognition in the limelight. So that way people would get more general idea and they could be able to bring more information about these people, all right? But let me continue. So it says, he received his master's from Harvard in 1932. Additional postgraduate work was done at the University of Chicago, Oxford University, and Cairo University. His knowledge of African studies was so vast that he was unable to obtain a PhD because there was no school with faculty members qualified to supervise his dissertation. Wow. But then it goes down to say, as a professor at Harvard, at Howard, Hansberry taught courses on African civilization and cultures. By the mid-1930s, he was internationally recognized by his peers as an outstanding scholar in his field. Along, among his students were two future African leaders. One was the future Canadian revolutionary Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah would later become the first prime minister and the president of Ghana. The other one was Namadi Azikiwe who studied anthropology under him from 1928 to 1929 and wrote a eulogy for him. Azikawe would become the first president of Nigeria in 1961. Then Nigerian Governor General Azikawe thought Hansberry worked so important that he offered to underwrite the publication of his major work, The Rise and Decline of the Ethiopian Empire. But see, this is part we don't know. But it, people tell us that Pan-Africanism is not important. But you see, William Leo Hansberry had two Africans under him. He had Kwame Nkrumah, and he also had he had uh, Inamdi Ezekwe under him as well. So he taught two African people to African students who became prominent leaders.
But let me continue on. It says, although Hansberry courses were very popular with students, two distinguished faculty members accused Hansberry of teaching a subject matter without adequate research to support it. With the program and his job on the line, Hansberry presented the Board of Trustees with detailed documentation of his research. While he managed to save the African Studies program, Hansberry research funding was cut off and he would not receive tenure until 1938. Imagine that despise the instinctive research he conducted over his lifetime. Hansberry was very reluctant to have his work published. James William, one of his former students and later a senior professor of African history at Har Howard recalled in 1972 that when his students urged publication of his work, Hansberry would smile but always firmly reply, I am not ready yet. Hansberry retired from Howard in June of 1959. So he married Myrtle Caliso of Meriden Lauderdale County, Mississippi on June 22, 1937 in Chicago. So she is the daughter of Willie and Mammy Caliso. The two children were born to this union. Gail Adele Hansberry and Myrtle K. Hansberry. While visiting relatives in Chicago, Hansberry died at Billings Hospital of Cerebral Hemorrhage on November 3, 1965. In 1972, he finally received recognition from the university that had snubbed him when Howard named a lecture hall in his honor. So William Leo Hansberry was a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. All right. So that's that information. And as you can see, you can also check out the sources at the bottom of the page, the references. Okay. And there's some more links that you can look at at the bottom as well. So, so yeah, again, he wasn't, he didn't receive his credit due. So imagine your job being threatened because they felt like your work was not um, academically correct. Even when he showed proof, it was still like placing him under pressure. Right? He was placed under pressure and he was so he was under pressure so much to where he didn't want to just put out the book. He was like, it ain't no purpose. He felt there was no purpose of him putting out a book. But he did. Okay. So now let's go ahead and look at one of the books that was Hey, Vinyasa, how you doing? All right. Anyways, um, here's one of the sources. Oh, yeah, everything's going fine with me. I can't complain. All right, so now here's one of the books that was written. It's called The Pillars in Ethiopian History, right? So it was edited by Joseph E. Harris, but this is the book that deal with African history, okay? All right, so... Let's go ahead and let's get into the chapter of this book, shall we? All right, so.
Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, then. So now let's go ahead. And let's get into the chapter. Let's see where we want to start at. All right, so right here, the profile of a pioneer Africanist. All right, so the first chapter is the Queen of Sheba, a source of national identity in Ethiopia. So now he spoke a lot on Ethiopia, if you notice that. Well, let's go ahead and let's get on page 33. All right, so right here. Kind of zoom it up a little bit so y'all can see. All right, there we go. So it says, the Queen of Sheba is a source of national identity in Ethiopia. The story of the Queen of Sheba is one of the most ubiquitous and compelling legends in history. It has been perpetuated in various parts of the world in literature, music, and painting, right? So it says the sessional components of the legend are derived from both Ethiopian and non-Ethiopian sources. The latter include the biblical accounts, the Quranic version, and supplements by Muslim commentators and Jewish sources. The Ethiopian component of the legend is rooted in the Kibera Nagas and Fata Nagas. All right. Then it goes on to say the most important of the Ethiopian sources is the Kibera Nagas, whose significance is minimized by some authority because it appears after the restoration in the 14th century of the Semitic dynasty, which it justifies and identifies with the Queen of Sheba. Other authorities accept the explanation that the document is a translation of a source found early in the 4th century AD and is legitimate. Professor Hansberry accepted the latter position. Then going down. Then goes down, say, no one, no name or royal title relating to a woman of historical antiquity is more familiar to, to the learn and the latitude of the Western world than is the Queen of Sheba. Tradition concerning her visit to King Solomon are infinitely better known than is the story of Jezebel hapless adventure at a hop court and the stirring story of Queen Hashapusu or Hashusu. Sorry, can't even get that right. Anyways, famous expedition to punt. Um, not even the thrilling romance is woven around the love affairs of as Aspatia and Purcell, Purcell, yeah, Aspatia and Purcells, and Theodora and Justine, or even Cleopatra and Mark Antony have a attained a wide popular fame. So, as you can see, it says, "But who was the Queen of Sheba, and where was the kingdom over which she held royal sway?" Ancient, medieval, and modern writers have never been able to arrive at a common answer to these questions. In Ethiopia, it has long been all but universally believed that she was an Ethiopian queen named Makeda. And there have been a number of Western authors who have shared Ethiopian opinions in this respect. All right. So it says, among the ancient were Flavius Jophysis, the famous Jewish historian and such fathers of church as Oregon and St. Oslam and the great St. Augustine in the Middle Ages and early modern times, those of similar opinions include the anonymous 12th century author of the De Imenja Manunda, Abu Sali, and Father Francisco Alvarez, Alfonso Mendez and Pedro Paez, as well as the noted 17th century Portuguese historian, Father Toledo and Balthazar Teles. In more recent times, the great explorer James Bruce, the noted missionary, J.L. Carath, and the learned 
was oh and to learn French historian Louise J oh Louis J Mori and reservation Sir Wallace Budge must be added to the list. Now it's funny they talk about Makeda. So I don't know if you guys remember that song by Le Nubian. Le Nubian uh, are two women. They two sisters. They actually from the Congos, but they was raised in France. They was raised in Paris. They had a song called Makeda. And it's a beautiful song, but they the only problem is it was in French. It was in French. But the song, the vibe, the energy was right. And the only thing I can remember, they were saying Makeda. And then the part they go, whoa, whoa, do, 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 do. Whoa, whoa, do, 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 do. Whoa, whoa. But anyway, in that song, they were telling a story about the, the Queen of Sheba, right, and Solomon. So I'm a, I'm gonna type in the song. You guys can look it up. The name of the group. It's called Led Nubians Makeda. So you guys can check that song out. It's a very old song. It's a beautiful song. Um, I wish I could play it, but I don't want to get hit with no copyrights. So yeah, but. Yeah, the song is sung in French. That's the only thing about it. It's not sung in English. And I wish I could understand everything they were saying. So you had to go get the translation version and read what they're talking about. But it's beautiful. Because I remember they used to play it on BET. I seen the videos. It was like at some type of festival event. And yeah, they used to play it on BET. And I used to just sit there and just be jamming to it. Jamming to the beat and all. But anyways, enough of that. <laughs> um, if you guys want to, you guys make sure you get this book right here. Okay. It's called African History Notebook, Pillars in Ethiopian History. All right. Um, <clears throat> so now with that being said, let me go ahead and show you guys another book. All right. So this is not his book. Actually, it's an essay. So it's composed of multiple authors in this book. All right, so this one is called Africa and Afro American Experience. <clears throat> All right, it's edited by Lorraine A. Williams. So let me show you guys the title. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Peace to you. How you doing? All right, so this one's called Africa and the Afro-American Experience. Eight essays edited by Lorraine A. Williams. All right. So one, the, uh, one of his works is in here. As a matter of fact, I think yeah, it's the first chapter. So it's chapter three and it's chapter one. Okay, on page three in this book. So let me go ahead and scroll on down. All right. There we go. All right, so it says, Africana at Insuka. Some distinctive aspect of program of African studies at the University of Nigeria by William Leo Hansberry. Okay. 
Now, let's just go right here. It says the locale. And Suka is an ordinary Nigerian village in most respects, but the climate and the natural beauty of its immediate surroundings are of a character which are wary strangers from afar on their initial visit, usually witnessed with profound surprise. Although it is situated in the midst of tropical Africa, the temperature at Insuka, because of its high altitude, is prevailingly mild and pleasant throughout the year as it generally true in the lands of internal spring on the vast East African plateau, Swetherland summers comparable to those of many countries in the misnamed temperate zone never occur and the grim realities of northern winters are of course wholly unknown. To most people in western lands, tropical Africa is generally pictured as a vast and forbidding jungle filled with snorting elephants, roaring lions, and other bellow beasts of disturbing mean, but the plant and animal life of the region about Insuka is decidedly at odds with such preconceived notion. No elephant or lions or other jungle behold was it behemoths behemoths are to be found, except in an occasional zoo here and there within hundreds of miles of Inzuka. It is an open country of great natural beauty which surrounds the village on every side. Great grass covered valleys and dales and rolling hills of emerald green dominate the landscape as far as the, the eye can reach, and graceful palm and other flowering or fruit bearing trees and snow dot the park light seen in all directions. In other words, in Suka is blessed by nature, as are the French and Italian Riveras and parts of Florida and California with what has been aptly described as a millionaire's climate. Its natural surrounding recall idyllic scenes attributed by the classical poets to Isle of the Blessed. So basically he's talking about a village in Nigeria, okay, called the Insuka. So that's what he was going to that contest. He basically dealing with the academic uh, research behind that. And let's see. So go further down. It says, but in Suka's natural beauty and natural advantages are not the things for which this little village is destined in due course to be to be most widely known, it is rather the fact that in its midst then the University of Nigeria that will eventually bring Tensuka its greatest acclaim for the University of Nigeria, though one of the world's youngest, is nonetheless one of the world's most remarkable institution of learning, and there are already many internal indications that it will grow in uniqueness and distinction with the passing of the years. Right, so in January 1960, the beautiful site on which the university now stands was still covered by virgin growth, which had dominated the landscape for a countless decade. But in January 1963, a bare three years later, there stood on the same site a total of nearly 200 completed academic buildings and residential halls, which had been erected at a cost of over $20 million. These buildings were occupied by nearly 2,000 students enrolled in six different colleges, right? And over 400 persons compromising the university's teaching and administrative staffs and members of their immediate family. All of the buildings mentioned were situated along well laid out streets, and there was also in operation a large power plant which provided the university with its own electricity and water supply. On the edge of the main campus, there was a concrete stadium, much of it covered, which was capable of seating over 20,000 persons. All right. So basically that's uh, him giving a historical content by Insuka, which again, that's a village in Nigeria. Uh, is it still around today? Just out of curiosity. Well, so it's actually a town, my mistake, all right? Let's just pull this up real quick before I um, 
before I go on to the next thing. So real quick, let's look more into Insuka. All right, so Insuka is a town and local government area in Enigu State, Nigeria. Insuka shares common border as a town with Indim, Opi, Ode, Abala, and Obimo. So the postal code of the area is 41001, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, uh, in Suka made up of Imponano, Inru, and Inhin, Orire. Presently, there is an erroneous trend of referring to all the towns under Iningu North Senatorial Zone as Insuka. This trend could be res could be as a result of Insuka housing the headquarters of now defunct Insuka province under colonial rule. All right, so let me pull up the map. So right here, this is where Insuka would be right up in this area. All right, so again, it's a town. All right, but at that time, um, it was, you know, it was a small town during that time period. And it says people in Suka speak Central Igbo and Suka dialect and a sub dialect of larger Igbo language. So the influence of the Suka people was felt as far as Ada, the Achudu, Oka, Ata clan in Ada historically migrated from Insuka. Hmm. And so that's interesting history. Um, again, I never heard of this tribe before. I never heard of the village about Insuka, but this is my first time learning. But it's very unique that uh, William Leo Hansberry was able to branch out and go so far as to study about this particular village in Nigeria. All right, but if you guys want to read up more about it, um, just type in Insuka and you'll find out more information. All right. Um, so here's another journal article that he has written. Okay. So this one is called the Journal of Negro History. Right, the material culture of ancient Nigeria, and this was uh, this is volume six and July of 1921, in volume number three. Okay, so it says the material culture of ancient Nigeria. So he goes into that and check this out. It goes on to say the opinion of Western world towards Africa and Africans is in the process of a very slow yet tremendous change. The distant yet ultimate development of this process will bring about a most important revolution in the world of modern thought. It will be marked by a complete reversal of the prevailing present day evaluation of the history of continent and of the accomplishment and possibility of a great people. To the lay mind of modern world, Africa is a gigantic jungle of barbarians, bamboo, and baboon, where Livingstone traveled, Rose Prospect, and Roosevelt hunted. Furthermore, it is only within the last 20, 25 years or more that even that learned group whose profession is the exposure and or exposition and interpretation of human history has begun to modify its opinions in this connection. So an insight into the spirit of learned opinion regarding Africa and the Africans only a comparatively short time ago may be gained from following article which appeared in a Berlin journal in 1891. The article in part runs with regard to its Negro population. Africa in contemporary opinion offers no historical enigma which calls for a solution because from all the information supplied by our explorers and et ethnologists, 
The his history of civilization proper in the continent begins as far as concerned its inhabitants only with the Mohammedan invasion. <laughs> And, and the reason why I laugh like this is because it sounds so familiar to me. And then it goes on to say, before the introduction of a genuine faith and a higher standard of a culture by the Arabs, the nation had neither political organization nor, strictly speaking, any religion nor any industrial development. None but the most primitive is instincts determine the lives and conduct of the Negroes who lack every kind of ethical inspiration. Every judicial observer and critic of alleged African culture must once for all make up his mind to renounce the charm of poetry and wizardly of fairy lore, all those things which in other parts of the world remind us of a past fertile in legend and song. That is to say, must bid farewell to attraction offered by beyond the history by the hope of eventually realizing the tangible and palpable realm conjured up in the distance which time has veiled within its midst and by the expectation of ultimately wrestling some relics of antiquity every now and again from the lap of the earth. You know, but I'm I'm gonna uh, get my thoughts on this that little paragraph. But let me just go ahead and continue. It says, but now this view of Black Africa and its people so widespread and well established a generation ago is being slowly dissipated, and a new and revolution view of the mysterious contents is building itself in its stead. The facts and forces be bringing about this great change fall into three main classes. They are historical, archaeological, and ethological character. All right, so what is eth ethnology? Now, ethnology is dealing with physical characteristics of individuals, okay? That's what ethnology is, dealing with the phenotype, dealing with the behavior, etc. okay? That's one. Um, of course, you guys know what archaeology and historical means, but yeah, for those who may not be familiar with ethnology, deals with it deals with the physical characteristic, and it deals with you know uh, social behavior and all. All right, so here's the thing: people is under the preconceived notion that West Africa has no historical beginnings because it's not often talked about in the mainstream. And that's not really the case because there is a lot of historical information, but it has not been yet to be discovered. There's only just a few information that we know of about West Africa regarding to uh, the events and the uh, historical settings. Now, Slowly for surely, they're starting to bring about technological advances to find out more, right? But what we know, we know about Timbuktu. People know about the Dogon tribe. Okay, people know about the Songhai Empire, the um, the Hominy Empire. I mean, not the Dahomey, but the Dahomey tribe. Um. What's the other one? It was just on top of my head. Um, dang, it. it was just on top of my head. Uh, you know, the Fulani, I know it's part of the Fulani uh, Empire. I can't think of the name of it. It was just right off the top of my head. But Anyways, there um and the Ghana Empire as well. So there's different empires in West Africa, and then we also hear about the Trans-Saharan slave trade, and of course the Transatlantic slave trade. Now, the reason there is the reason why there isn't enough historical information about West Africa is because the way they do things, see, it's different. It's more so like oral tradition, okay? 
they like to orally tell their story. And many coaches do not believe in excavation. What I mean by that, they don't believe in going digging up the graves and getting fossils or getting bones and all of that to present to the public or have it displayed in the museum. They don't believe in that. And most of the coaches in West Africa, because they believe the dead should be at peace. That's why we say rest in peace, because you let the dead be at peace. You don't go once you bury somebody. That's it. You don't go and dig up the graves and to find out nothing. All right. You don't do that. So it's coaches that don't believe in that. They don't believe in all of that excavation. All right. So the information is there, but it's just so funny because I have heard people thinking that African people are not scientifically literary, which they are, but they deal with science from a cultural standpoint. They don't deal with science from how we deal with science here in the United States. Okay. So yes, science is universal, but they deal with the scientific knowledge from cultural understanding, through cultural interpretation, through spiritual interpretation. That's how they deal with science. Everybody don't have the same cult cultural interpretation when it comes to scientific knowledge. Okay. All right. So they don't speak the same language is basically what I'm saying. So, <laughs> so with that being said, I could be speaking French and somebody can be speaking Spanish, but we both could be saying the same thing. It's just how it's spoken, right? So a person can do their scientific method this way, and somebody else could do the scientific method the other way, but they get the same conclusion. And that's what we have to realize that and a lot of us don't get that here in the West because we think that everybody's supposed to do what we do over here, and that's not the case. But Anyways, um, that's this article here, which is the Journal of Negro History. All right, so you guys can look that up. I got this from journals.uchicago.edu. So I got this from the uh, University of Chicago website, which is journals.universityofchicago.edu. All right, um. So last but not least, I want to show you guys the website. Okay. Let me go ahead and show you guys the website. All right. So this is the William Leo Hansberry website. It's called hansberrysoc.org, which is hansberrysociety.org. Okay. So um, that's the website. So this is the home page right here. Okay. So it's a dedication to him. And it goes into all the resources they have available. And then you go into the about section, of course, they talk about his life, his legacy, and et cetera. So it says our team, we are archaeologists, zoo archaeologists, bioarchaeologists, Nubiologists mean that the study of Nubia, Egyptologists, Ethiopianists, and Africana studies scholars who academic specialty focus on the ancient history, language, and culture of Northeast Africa. Our team consists of scholars at varying levels of their careers, including masters and doctoral students, independent researcher, and university faculty. And that's pretty good. That's pretty good. They're diverse like that because. You need that diversity of independent researchers, people who have a master and doctoral degrees, and who are also uh, faculty members. You know that that's just that's good to have a diversity. Okay, so as you can see, most of the members here are black. So you got Dr. Salon Ashby over here. Okay, so if you guys are not familiar with her work, she's an anthropologist, but also she's an Egyptologist. So Dr. Shalon Ashby is right there. All right. So again, most of the people on here, they're, oh, 
that's a familiar face right there. Oh, <laughs> I'm familiar. I know this guy right here, Dr. Salim Faraji. Dr. Salim Faraji. Okay. All right. I know that face. I know that face very well. All right. But, and see, you got Dr. Yosef Ben Levy. All right. I'm assuming that he might be a Hebrew Israelite or something like that, or a Jew, but he's an African scholar. All right. Oh, Dr. Mario BT. You got Dr. Mario BT over here. Let's see who else. You see, so it's a lot of people. So most of the people that we see are African descended. So, well, basically they are African descended. Um, as we can see here. Yep. We can see that they are African descended. You know, African from the diaspora, African from the continent. But this is the website. So it's Hansberry's uh, Society.org. You can just go check out the website, Hansberry SOC.org. All right. Okay. So. So anyway, that's all that I have for tonight. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming through. I appreciate that. Now, I want to say this. Um, I've noticed something about YouTube. I don't get a chance to see all the comments. So I don't get a chance to see the comments on the chat on the computer. So what I have to do is I would have to look through my cell phone and see if anybody made commentary. So, hmm. So give me a moment. All right, so let me see if I can uh, find any comments on here in the comment section. All right, so maybe, maybe everything is cool then. All right, so for some reason, I don't get to see all the comments on the computer, but I have to look through my cell phone. And I know it's like once I log off of here, that's when the comments start popping up. So yeah but that's how you two do it i don't understand why for the life of me but anyways i thank you guys for watching the video and also please make sure you guys check out my video about umoja kamaru so umoja kamaru means a unity feast right it's like it's like an alternative to thanksgiving so if you don't want to celebrate thanksgiving you can celebrate Omoja Kamaru, which is on the fourth of is the fourth Sunday of November. So it's the fourth Sunday of November. So it usually comes right after Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, I did a video about that, so you can check out my video. So as a matter of fact, I'm gonna type it in the comment section. The history of Omoja. All right, so you guys can just check out that video, look it up for yourself. So, yeah, it started in Philadelphia around the 70s by um, I'm going to say, who, who was it created by? It was created by Dr. Edward Sims. Yeah, so it was created by Dr. Edward Sims Jr. 
All right. So he created the holiday, which is known as Umoja Kamaru, uh, around 1971. All right. So a lot of people don't celebrate, but there are certain people that celebrate that, especially those within the Pan-African churches. They do celebrate that holiday. But just give y'all the insight. If y'all want to celebrate that instead of celebrating Thanksgiving, you guys can do so. And just make sure you guys check out that video. Um, I did it about a year or two ago, so you guys can check it out, look up information on that. But anyways, that's all I have for you all. So thank you guys for showing support. Uh, shout out to everybody in the chat. And also check out that song by Le Nubian. It's called Makeda. Yeah, so if you understand French, you can be able to get the song. But if not, you're going to have to read up the transcript to find out what they're talking about. All right. But anyways, thank you, Centavo. Thank you, Norman. Uh, thank you, Vinyasa, for coming through. Thank you, Kent. And thank you, Big Cree Money. Thank everybody that's been watching. So for those of you just coming in, you have to check out the video from the very beginning. But until then, y'all take it easy on yourself. Y'all be safe. Until next time, peace and power elevation be to all of you. This your girl, Tiffany. And y'all enjoy yourself on this Thanksgiving Eve on Commemoration Day. This Commemoration Day, which is going to be tomorrow, Thursday. And I'll talk to y'all again. Peace. All right.